Hello and welcome to this video podcast for human genetics. In the last video podcast, I introduced to you some of the concepts and ideas of gene regulation. And we talked about some specific examples as they related to hemoglobin and how those genes change expression depending upon the stage of life. And in this podcast, we want to pick up this discussion and talk about some of the mechanisms that are used to regulate which genes are expressed. So let's go ahead and get started. So we know that different cell types will express different genes. We know that different cells as an embryo versus an adult will express different genes. But the big question is how do our cells know which genes to turn on or off? They, they have this cast of 23,000 genes that somehow the cells have the ability to determine which of those 23,000 genes to turn on and which to keep off. It's pretty impressive. And, and the amazing thing is, of my 30-some trillion cells, the individual cells make this determination of which genes to turn on or off what appears to be all by themselves. I, I don't have to tell them what to do. Thankfully, they just do it. And so how do our cells know automatically, so to speak, which genes to turn on and which to keep off? So I'm going to draw a typical gene that we talked about before. And remember, the gene has many parts to it. And I'm just going to show it this way. We know we have a promoter. We know we have the protein encoding portion. You know, the part that starts with the start codon and ends with the stop codon. And then we know we have this termination sequence. And so the key is this. When RNA polymerase come along, how does it know to bind to the promoter or not bind to the promoter? And that's what we're going to spend the next bit of our time on. And we could teach, in fact we do, we could teach whole semesters on this specific question of how we turn a gene on or off. We could spend an embarrassingly long amount of time just talking about how RNA polymerase knows to bind to this promoter at the right time. But we're going to be a little bit more brief about it and we're going to focus on these two main areas. The first is chromatin remodeling. And when we talk about that, we'll talk a little bit about epigenetics as well. We introduced epigenetics a couple chapters ago when we talked about genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is a type of epigenetics. Then we're also going to talk about micro RNAs. We can also think of it this way. The first one, chromatin remodeling, occurs before transcription. TXN is my abbreviation. And micro RNAs, this way of regulating a gene, occurs after transcription. Okay, so let's begin with chromatin remodeling. And we're going to spend most of our time with chromatin remodeling. And we'll just spend a little bit of time with microRNAs. Now, a, a few chapters ago, we talked about the nucleosome. And remember, the nucleosome had the DNA, which I'm drawing here, with histone proteins attached to them. I'll just draw four. Remember that there are eight histones that make up a nucleosome. But I'm just drawing four of them. And for lack of a better way to identify these regions, let's just call this gene A, gene B, gene C, and gene D. I want to acknowledge, though, that I'm greatly oversimplifying the way genes would be organized. A single gene would have many nucleosomes attached to it. I'm simplifying this by just saying there is a gene A that is in that is within this one nucleosome, a gene B within this other nucleosome, gene C in this nucleosome, and gene D in this nucleosome. But remember, usually many nucleosomes per, per gene. As this is written, all four of these genes are off. They are transcriptionally off because the DNA, the promoter sequence here, that would need to be accessed is hidden. The histone proteins, this nucleosome here, hides that gene. So we can't turn that gene on. For now, let's think of it this way. Let's think about active genes and inactive genes. We know that we can activate or inactivate a gene by adding various chemicals to these histone proteins. We're going to talk about three of those today. One of those chemical modifications is called acetylation. Another is phosphorylation. And the last one is methylation. And what I want you to know is that an active gene will have acetyl groups added to the nucleosome. An active gene will have 
phosphate groups added to the histone proteins, to the nucleosome. Active genes will have methyl groups removed from the histone proteins. And essentially down here is going to be the reverse, but let's go ahead and walk through it. An inactive gene will have acetyl groups removed from the histones. Inactive genes will have phosphate groups removed from the histone proteins. And inactive genes will have methyl groups added to the histone proteins. So let's walk through a couple of these using this diagram here. Now remember, every cell in our body would have genes A, B, C, and D. But let's say that gene A is a brain gene. You don't have to be specific, but let's just say it functions in the brain. And let's also say that gene D also functions in the brain. And let's say that gene B here functions in the liver and gene C functions in the heart. So if we're looking at brain tissue, we need to open up these genes. We need to activate genes A and genes D, but we need to keep genes B and C off. And we're gonna do that by using acetylation, phosphorylation, and methylation. Let's begin with methylation, the last one here. We want genes B and C to be off, because again, remember, let's write this down here somewhere, that right now we are in, we'll put it down here, brain tissue. We're looking at these genes in our brain. Genes B and C need to be turned off in our brain because they function in the liver or the heart, respectively. So for those genes to be inactive, we'll need to add methyl groups to the histones. And so I'm just going to put it like that. And I should also say that it's not just randomly that they're methylated. There are very specific sequences on those proteins where it's methylated. It's not necessary that each of these histones get methylated. But the take home point, the main take home point I want you to remember is that when you add a methyl group, it keeps that gene inactive. It keeps the histone proteins bound to the DNA so that the transcription factors, the RNA polymerases cannot gain access to the DNA. Methylation of the histones keeps the gene off. Now we want these two genes to be available for RNA polymerase and transcription factors. So we want to remove these histones. So I'm going to redraw this as something like this. And, and we can say that our genes promoter was tied up here. And now the promoter is available to have the transcription factors and the RNA and the RNA polymerase bind here to activate this gene. Now it didn't just randomly happen that those histones fell off, as you can see from down here. Those histones were either acetylated or they were phosphorylated, or they could, could have been both acetylated and phosphorylated. And so what I'm going to do is, because I'm going to draw the histones far away, just to make sure it's clear that they're not associated with the DNA anymore. So I'm just going to draw them here, mainly because I don't have anywhere else to draw them. Sad but true. And so these are going to now have acetyl groups added to them, or they might have a phosphate group added to them, or they might have both added to them. And again, just like with the methylation, they will bind to specific histone proteins at specific amino acid sequences. You don't need to know which those are, those are for this class, but you should know that histones that are acetylated or phosphorylated cause the histone proteins to fall off the DNA, allowing the DNA to unravel, exposing the promoters to the necessary enzymes so that we can begin transcription. And we can draw those necessary enzymes in here. We have transcription factors, TF. We also have RNA polymerases that can now bind here and they can begin to transcribe this gene to ultimately make the messenger RNA and the protein to, to do whatever that function is in the brain. Now I didn't draw it here. You can draw it on your own, but I think, I think my board is messy enough the way it is right now. But this is also a brain gene. These histone proteins would also have to be removed and they would be removed in a similar mechanism by acetylating them or by phosphorylating them to allow access to the genes. This here could be drawn just like it is over here. All right, so the big take home points here with chromatin remodeling is that by adding chemicals to the histones, we change the ability of these histones to bind to DNA, which then affects the relative ease or difficulty in transcribing the genes associated with those histone nucleosome areas. Now, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about histone 
acetylation. And in doing so, I want to talk about two enzymes, histone acetyltransferase. We'll call that a hat. And then I want to talk about histone deacetylases. And we usually just refer to these as HDACs, H-D-A-C. Remember on the last slide, we showed the DNA like this. This is going to be a much smaller one, where the histones could be attached. And that it could move from histones being attached to histones being removed. The gene in this state here would be off. The gene in this state here would be on. How do these enzymes help do this? Well, I want you to know that histone acetyltransferases, they do one of two important things. They add an acetyl group and they are associated with activating, or you could say turning on, gene expression. So our histone acetyltransferases, the hats here, they get added here. And when they do so, they add acetyl groups to the histones. And when they add the acetyl groups to the histones, the histones fall off. Hats come in to the DNA, they add acetyl groups to the histones, the histones fall off, gene expression is now activated. Now, this arrow I drew from the on to the off state can go this way. And it goes reverse here using our friend HDAC. Histone deacetylases, they will come along here and they will remove the acetyl groups on the histones. And when they remove the acetyl groups, they can now, the histones can now once again bind to the DNA and turn it off. Hats add acetyl groups, turn the genes on. HDACs remove the acetyl groups. We can just put a cross through there with the green marker here to show it's being done by the HDAC. HDACs remove those acetyl groups and they allow the nucleosomes to reform. I made a short list with the hats. Let's go ahead and make a short list with the histone deacetylases. They remove acetyl groups and they turn off gene expression. This is a major way that gene expression is regulated. And I want to talk about how this can be related to a particular disease. And I want to talk about this disease called leukemia, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, but maybe not everyone. In a very abbreviated definition, leukemia is a blood cancer. And we should put white blood cells. To describe what's happening with this one type of leukemia, and there's many types of leukemia, leukemia but in this one type, I'm going to show these many genes here that are all locked up. That is, they're turned off because they are packaged up into nucleosomes. And for our example here, we're going to say that this gene here causes cell growth. It allows the cell to go through that cell cycle a little faster. In this one kind of leukemia, there is an abnormal protein. And so I'm just going to put it as a protein. And, and what I want you to know is that this protein changes chromatin structure of many genes. And in this particular case, this gene here, which is usually inhibited by these, by the presence of the nucleosome, now is open. So usually this gene is inactive, but because of this one protein that is mutated in this kind of cancer, this gene here now is opened and can now be activated. And remember I said this gene played a big role in the cell cycle. So now this gene here with the promoter here and the rest of the gene following is now activated and that results in increased gene expression. So by altering the chromatin structure with this mutated protein, a gene that is not normally expressed is now expressed and it can lead to cancer. Okay, so cancer is the ha a hallmark of cancer, which we'll talk about later, is that it grows quickly and without regulation. And that's what this mutation does. It doesn't change this gene, doesn't change the way its sequence is, it's just changing the expression of it. Now that leads us nicely into this next topic called epigenetics. We could spend an entire semester talking about epigenetics and in fact, in one of my classes, we do spend an entire semester talking about it. But today we really only have time to kind of give you the hallmarks of it. Let's give it a quick definition. It's the study of heritable phenotypes that do not 
alter the DNA sequence, but do alter gene expression. For instance, on the last whiteboard, we didn't change the gene sequence of that gene necessary for cell cycle division. We just changed how it was expressed. So there are five features of epigenetics I would like you to know. It's essentially everything we've just been talking about. So it includes chromatin modification, modifying those proteins, the acetyl groups, the phosphate groups, the methyl groups, all of that is an epigenetic way of changing the expression of a gene without changing the gene itself. Linked to that, it's really important to remember that epigenetics is not a mutation. If we say something has a an epigenetic effect, we're specifically saying that it is not a mutation. The DNA sequence is unchanged. I'm going to say this, it remembers. What I mean by that is when you have a cell, and I'm going to just write under here gene a is acetylated. When it divides, it remains acetylated. And that can be the case for the next hundred divisions of this cell. It can remember. In fact, a really amazing thing about epigenetics, at least I feel it's amazing, is that when genes in your sex cells, in sper sperm and eggs, when they are epigenetically changed, that is passed on to your children. And it remembers that expression, so to speak, in your children, and it can be passed on to your grandchildren. So how are these alterations occurring? And so that's linked with this remembering thing. So these are heavily influenced by the environment. Something you experience as a child can change the expression of the, of the genes in your gametes. And then that can be passed on to your kids even though the thing you experienced might be 20 years before you actually had kids. It's a little frightening in some ways that some things that we did as an adolescent may come back in and change the expression or even in some cases harm our children. And the last thing I want to say is going to be kind of counterintuitive to this it remembers statement, but it is reversible. Even though this gene is acetylated and it's no reason to think it's not going to remain acetylated. There could be another environmental exposure that causes it to get deacetylated. So it is reversible, but not, but not necessarily easily reversible. There are great examples of epigenetics and how it affects future progeny. And I'd love to be able to tell you more stories. And I'm sure you would love to sit through another six hours of podcasts to hear them all, right? But I'm going to make you listen to this one story because it's kind of kind of cool. So they did this study where they took a mouse, and maybe I just want to tell the story because I know how impressed you are of my mice. So there's my mouse, and this mouse had pups. So they had these baby mice. That was one experiment. And then in another one, they took a mouse, a female mouse, that is, just like this one was a female mouse, and she also had pups. So a bunch of baby mice. Now, the only difference here is that this mom here was allowed to nurture these pups. So let's write underneath here, plus nurturing. And for a mouse, that means she was in close contact with her pups. She regularly groomed them, she licked them, she took good care of them. Over here, minus nurturing. The pups were not allowed to be nurtured. When they looked at the genomes of these mice, what they discovered was that there were altered chromatin modifications. In some genes, there were more methylation in these, these pups, less here. There might have been less phosphorylation in some genes here, but more over here. So there was this clear pattern that the genes were being differentially altered based upon whether or not the mother nurtured the pups. And in the end, what happened was that these pups were healthier and they were less stressed. These mice over here, less healthy and more stressed. They will do things to, and look at like how easily the mice are startled is one way they might measure stress. How they behave in new environments, different things like that. So these were more stressed. All right, now that in itself is pretty fascinating. But what is even more amazing 
Again, I'm nerding out just a little bit. I warned you, this is my favorite chapter. These mice here, if they were to go on and have pups of their own, so next litter of pups from these mice, and they were allowed to nurture, so let's just write that here, were allowed to nurture. So remember, mom did not nurture these pups. These pups now are going to have their own baby mice, pups, and they are allowed to nurture, nurture them. Their progeny, the new round of little mice here, were less healthy and more stressed. The neglect of the original mother was passed on to her kids and then to her grand pups, if that's what they're called in mice. So it's that whole it remembers kind of way of when it, it affects the DNA expression, it's hard to remove that. Subsequently, they have shown similar correlations in human studies with parents who are more nurturing versus parents who are less nurturing. Parents who were addicted to drugs or were alcoholics versus parents who were not. So studying these mice in these kinds of situations have led us to understand some of the social impacts of how less nurturing, perhaps even neglectful parents can have on their children and their grandchildren and even their great-grandchildren. All right, well, let's move on. So we talked about how chromatin remodeling can affect gene expression. And now briefly, I'm not gonna spend much time at all. We're gonna talk about microRNAs. If we talk about, let's write the central dogma here, never gets old. Chromatin remodeling was here at that level of transcription, right? So that's chromatin remodeling. It affects whether or not a gene is going to be transcribed into RNA. And this we can think of as kind of like this big on off switch, not a lot of modulation. It's either on or it's off. MicroRNA is here. It's going to affect whether or not this messenger RNA can be translated into a protein. And we think of this as much more of a refined, fine mint, I should say, to gene expression. If chromatin remodeling is an on-off switch, microRNA is more of a dimmer. It controls a little bit more the degree to how much a gene will be expressed. Turns out this is an incredibly important way genes are expressed at this level. We know that approximately one-third of all genes in humans are regulated with microRNAs. So how does it do it? Well, let's spend a little time talking about it. Not nearly as much detail as we did with chromatin remodeling, but we should give it a little bit of justice here. So during transcription, we make this messenger RNA, five prime, three prime, with the GCAP, the poly tail, all the bells and whistles, this messenger RNA is ready to go to be made into a three-dimensional protein. What microRNAs do, and, and these are small, as the name micro might suggest, these are only about 20 to 23 bases long, and we have thousands of these in the cell that line specifically up on a particular gene. And what that does, it will turn off this expression. It prevents this protein from being made because now this messenger RNA cannot be translated. MicroRNAs bind to messenger RNAs to inhibit translation. And I promise you, it would be brief with this one. So that's all I'm gonna say about microRNAs. The last section of this chapter talks about a lot of the non-coding portions of our genome. And I think it's really important to mention a few things here about that because there are some misconceptions. So let's talk about non-coding DNA. And what we mean by that is any portion of our genome that doesn't make a protein or a messenger RNA initially. It turns out that of all the billions of bases that we have in our genome, that only 1.5% of our genome makes a protein. So let's think about the other 98.5%. What does it code for? We know it codes for other RNAs, like ribosomal RNAs, a lot of it does that, and tRNAs, as well as other RNAs that we talked about earlier in the semester. We know there's a lot of introns that aren't used to make proteins. That makes up a large portion of our genome as well. We know that there are a lot of regions 
that are control regions that help control whether or not this 1.5% gets expressed. And this next region that I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about are viruses. We know that approximately 8% of our genome is viral DNA. It's a little creepy. A lot of our genes, our genome, that we walk around and our, our species has been walking around with for a very, very long time is actually a viral origin. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about viruses. Viral DNA. Now what I'm going to explain here will not do justice to what you could learn in a virology class. That's the best we can do here. If this is our cell here, a human cell here, might as well just write that here, human cell. And we have our nucleus here, which I'll draw a little bit bigger than maybe I should. And we have our DNA here. And our human cell is doing everything at once. It's enjoying life. And then we have a virus, which is much smaller than a, a human cell. And by our definition of life, a virus is not even alive. So this virus will enter here. Sometimes the whole virus will enter. Or sometimes it'll just release its genetic material, which could be RNA or DNA. But for our purposes, to simplify this, we're just going to call it viral genetic material, VGM. Now sometimes this viral genetic material will stay in the cytoplasm, sometimes it will form its own little pocket of DNA, but what I want to talk about are those cases when this viral genetic material enters into our nucleus and becomes stably incorporated into our DNA, which I'll show like that. Now we haven't talked about HIV yet, but this is similar to what HIV does. HIV will inject its genetic material into a T cell or a B cell. That DNA goes through some processing, which we won't need to talk about, but eventually it is inserted into the genome of our white blood cells. And it may stay there for a long time. In fact, that's the goal of treating HIV, is to make sure that genetic material stays in the, in the chromosome. And as long as it stays in there, everything's fine. But sometimes though that genome as an escape plan. And part of that escape plan is that it will make new viral particles in the cytoplasm and it will exit this cell. If it's HIV, it would ex exit the white blood cell, kill that white blood cell, decrease the immunity of the individual, which then could lead to AIDS. All right, that's not what I want to talk about right here. I want to talk about the times when that viral genetic material remains in our DNA, our genome. In some cases, in fact, in many cases, that viral genome has been in our genome for so long and there's been certain mutations that have occurred on it that it can never leave. It's trapped now. And so that's why over at least the past five million years, viruses have been entering into our DNA or our ancestral species DNA. And over those many, many years, many of those sequences of DNA are stably incorporated into our genome. And they're there. They're not ever going to harm us. They're just there. Now, that sounds like a pretty good deal for the viruses. They get to put their G DNA in our genomes. We'll keep copying it over and over again for the rest of the life of our species. But do we get any benefit from this? We're copying their DNA for the rest of eternity. At least we should get some benefit from it. And it turns out we might, in fact. Remember, I just drew it there, but about, again, 8% of our genome is viral. To put that in perspective, one and a half percent of our genome, remember, makes protein. So we have more DNA in our cells that come from viruses than we have DNA that makes proteins. And there is evidence that this has played a critical role in human evolution and disease. Like I said, these genomes stay stably incorporated in our DNA for a long time. In the very rare cases, certain mutations that have occurred have allowed these viral DNAs to be expressed again. And in, again, some rare cases that has led to some various kinds of diseases. But I'm gonna spend a little more time talking about why this viral DNA seems to be important in evolution. Now, I'm just gonna say these two ideas that are perhaps linked to human evolution. The first thing is that there are viral sequences that make a protein 
that helps moving nutrients from mom to baby through the placenta. If you think about reptiles who lay eggs and the babies develop in the eggs or birds, that's a pretty good strategy. But one of the problems with that is that all the nutrients that developing baby, baby chick or baby, say turtle, all the nutrients they are going to need has to be put into that egg. In human development, that all occurs in mom. So there's got to be a way to help. There's got to be a way to pass those nutrients on. And we've introduced the placenta before, but it appears that there is viral sequence that makes movement of nutrients from mom to baby more efficient. There's also an idea that viral DNA helps protect developing the developing baby from mom's immune system. Both of these are thought to help in human evolution by allowing for a internal development of, of progeny. But that's all I want to say about this right now. And, and in fact, that ends this chapter. It was a pretty long chapter. Um, if you have any questions at all as you're going over this material, please make sure you ask me. If not, I will see you on the next podcast. And bye for now.